Good afternoon, fam. It's me. I'm back. Feeling a little bit better. Still got a little cough, but feeling better. Um, Hope everybody's doing well. Hope everybody's staying safe. Hope everybody's being smart. Hope everybody's paying attention, especially now because there's a lot going on right now. And of course, you know, uh, November the 3rd is quickly up coming upon us. And, um, you know, there's been talk from some white militia groups and, and, and you know, some white supremacist groups about how what they're going to do, uh, whether Trump is is, is reelected or not. Um, now, if Trump is not reelected, they have I mean, and they have made these announcements publicly. If Trump is not reelected, reelected, um, they say they're going to go out in the street with their guns and, you know, they're going to start killing folks. You know, they're going to start doing what they do. Um, and then they also say that even if Trump is elected, that they believe that black folks are going to be out in the street doing whatever. And, and they're going to also be out there in the street with guns. And um, so, you know, it, let's be mindful of, of what's going on. Let's be mindful of the times that we live in. Let's be mindful of the fact that um, these white militia groups and uh, are like the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys and, and, and other ones um, have used uh, everything that has happened, all the protests and everything that has taken place since George Floyd. They have used these as opportunities to go out and secretly hunt black folk. And secretly ambush black people. Um, so, and, you know, and to do all kinds of things to, you know, to riot, to loot, to start fires, to do all kinds of things that make it look like, you know, it's just black folks doing this. So, you know, let's be mindful of what we're doing, how we're moving. Um, this weekend, uh, 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 November the 2nd, November the 3rd, November the 4th. Let's just be mindful of how we're moving. Let's be very, very aware of our surroundings. You know, if you ain't got to be out doing nothing, don't be out doing nothing. You understand what I'm saying? Um, you know, go vote for whoever you're going to vote for. You know, we, we've already, I, I mean, it, it can't be made any clearer than it's already been made. Although I'm getting ready to bring you some more history because yes, this is history lesson part one. Um, but, you know, just be mindful, just be mindful, be careful, stay on code. Foundational black Americans, please stay on code. There is a code of conduct and that code of conduct is you don't do or say anything that's going to harm the foundational black American community as a whole. We've got to get out of this individualism and we've got to start looking at our community as a whole, as a collective, like these other groups do. You know, we've got to look at it like this. Well, if it don't benefit the collective, if it don't benefit everybody, then I can't sell out my community and my people just because there's a possibility that it might benefit me. Other groups don't do that. Other groups want tangibles. They want benefits. They want resources that uplift and help the entire community, the collective, not just one or two people. You know, they give us one or two black athletes or or actors or Oprah Winfrey and a Gail and a Stale King or whatever. They or these rappers and like I say, these entertainers and movie stars, they give us one or two of these black folks that, you know, with the appearance that they have made it and that they have arrived and that everything is OK, you know, and black people can do it, too. And all of that, while the collective, while the whole still continues to suffer and be oppressed and live in poverty. And I guess we, the average, ordinary, everyday person, I guess we're just supposed to kind of try to live vicariously through them. But living vicariously through somebody else doesn't pay your bills. You understand what I'm saying? It doesn't put food in your stomach. It doesn't take care of your family. It doesn't provide for your children. It doesn't provide any, uh, uh, any opportunity for you to build generational wealth for you to leave for your children and your children's children. So, you know, we've got to start thinking collectively. We've got to get out of this mindset that they have programmed us into with, with, uh, especially during slavery with, uh, meritorious manumission and, and, and all the little rewards and goodies and all of that that slaves could get for turning on each other and telling on each other and, and all of this kind of stuff. We've got to get out of that, uh, mindset that they programmed into us of this individualism. It's just all about me. As long as I'm taking care of me, I'm good. As long as I got mine, I'm good. That's, you know, that's what rappers like Lil Wayne coming out saying what he said about Donald Trump and, 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 and all of these different ones. That's the reason why 
They're standing up to support whoever they call themselves supporting. And they have every right to do that. But they're doing it because they're looking at their benefits. They're looking at what they have. They don't give a shit about the collective. They don't give a shit about the foundational black American community as a whole. And a lot of them are immigrants, so they don't care anyway. But even the ones that are not immigrants, even the ones that are FBA. Because we got a lot of coons and a lot of bed winches and bed books and, 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 and bootlicks that are foundational black Americans. And the, the reason why is because all they think about is themselves as long as I got mine. Without realizing that we see something that they don't see. And that is that they're just high priced slaves. They're just high paid slaves. That's it. So anyway. I, I, I don't want to keep going, going, going. Because I don't want to make this one too long. Because we've got history lesson part two coming after this. But this one was very important. And, and, and this was something that I needed to get out to y'all. So that y'all can listen to it and hear it and share it. And, and, and talk about it before the election, because it's very, very important to this election coming up, especially for black folks that are even considering that, that even have any any leaning towards voting for uh, 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 Kamala Harris, because this this go, this is about Kamala Harris. Right. This history lesson is a, is basically about Kamala Harris. Um. Now, as we all know, Kamala Harris is Indian, right? Now she, you know, she she puts on that she puts on and off that black, uh, whenever it suits her politically. But we all know that she's Indian. We all know that when she first came out to run for the Senate, she came out as the first Asian American, and um, um, and she's been called the first Indian American to do certain things and all of that. So she's only the first Black American woman now that um. They want to use her to pander to black women and to try to get the black vote and want to use her for that whole sister girl thing and black girl magic type stuff and all of that to get black women to come out and vote for Joe Biden. But any other time she's Indian, she switches. Like I said, she puts black on and off. She takes it off like an outfit. And, 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 and those of us who are black, us foundational black Americans, real black folks, we can't take our blackness on and off when it suits us. We black every day, all day. We black first, no matter what else we may be, we understand that we are black first and that we will continue to be black first. Um, but in doing my research and, 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 and in learning and in learning more about our history, which I which I tell which I advise everybody to do, learn more about foundational black American history, learn more about our history as black people, learn more about our history before slavery Um uh, in learning more, I, I ran across some work from Dr. Renuko Rashidi, and um, this particular piece that I want to listen, I want you to listen to because I'm gonna have all of this linked in the description box so you can go listen to all of it in its entire in its entirety. But I want y'all to hear just a little bits and pieces of it now. And in this particular uh, piece that you're gonna do, and this was some years ago. Uh, he, he was asked this question and he was asked to write an article, to write a piece uh, on this question. Are whites inherently evil? And, uh, and don't worry, I, I'll get around to how this is all about Kamala Harris. And in answering this question, uh, what he talks about is uh, the relationship that whites have always had with blacks. The relationship between white and black, the relationship between uh, uh, the European and um, the African as the African migrated all over uh, the world, all over the globe. And he, 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 he specifies, he makes it specific to three different relationships. The relationships that um, whites had with blacks in India, that white has, had, that's whites had with blacks in Australia and that whites had with blacks as far as the Tasmanian people were concerned because they genocided the whole Tasmanian society. They killed off every Tasmanian. There is there, there are no more living Tasmanian people and they were black. OK, so. um, Now, you have to remember, Kamala Harris is Indian. That's where she comes from. That's that's her heritage. Uh, even though on her birth certificate, her mother lists herself as Caucasian. Okay. 
<laughs> but we've seen the pictures, and you'll see one in this video, maybe two, of Kamala, of Kamala with her Indian family, the dot thing, uh, the sari, the, 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 you know, the whole uh, Indian get up. Um, and I'm sure they, uh, they, you know, even if she doesn't practice, even if she's not a practice, practicing Hindu, uh, uh, you know, Hindu is the religion over there. It's the, it's, it's the religious concept and all of that. And um, in order for you to really, really understand the culture that Kamala Harris is coming from, the background that Kamala Harris is coming from, the belief system that Kamala Harris is coming from, then you have to understand what's going on in India. And you have to understand the different castes uh, 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 and the whole Varner caste system that the white folks came in and, and set up. And all, you have to understand all of that. And you have to understand how culturally she was taught and she was raised to interact with and identify as far as black people are concerned. So let, let me let y'all listen to this because he, he can do a, a much, much better job of explaining than I can. So let me let y'all listen to just little bits and pieces of this so that we can bring this whole thing together. Okay. Now, remember, again, this is Dr. Now, this was uploaded August 10th, 2015. That's when this was uploaded. Um, the actual lecture, I think, was done a few years before that. But again, this is Dr. Runuko Rashidi, and he's talking about this question that he was asked, are whites inherently evil? Hold on. Today, or tonight I should say, we are supposed to talk about a very serious question. I was approached by a publication called Image Magazine, a new magazine. I don't know if you've seen it or not. Just came out about two months ago. I think it's subtitled Empowering the Black Man. They called me out of the clear blue. Can everybody hear me? Am I talking too loud? I know I'm talking fast. I'm very pumped up. Jamal, can you do anything about that? You're the man for all seasons, brother. I know you can do it. How's that? Is that any better? Yeah. Wonderful? Good. As long as you're happy. There's also some sisters standing. Hope we could do something about that. Even though they might have come late. <laughs> they asked me to write an article of about 3,000 words. I love to write. I love to sit in front of my computer, my word processor, in my study, like a monk in a monastery, and compose scripts about our people. And this subject matter was a little bit odd, though, but they wanted to pay me a decent amount of money, and it was something different. They wanted me to address the issue that all of us, I'm sure, have thought about at one time or another, are white people inherently evil? Are white people inherently evil? That's very thought-provoking. That's very provocative. And they wanted me to base it on unfavorable white-black relationships. That was not hard for me to do, because all the historical white-black relationships that I have found have been unfavorable all the white-black relationships that I have identified have been unfavorable for black people, with no exception. They wanted me to write it in a personalized manner, not real academic, <laughs> and they wanted me to deal with some subject matters or areas that are not normally dealt with. Most of us know about the slave experience. We know about all those black people. And notice I said black people, not slaves, because slaves were not brought from Africa. Africans were brought from Africa, and they were enslaved on the way over here. Slaves did not come from Africa. Africans came from Africa. Look at it from a different perspective. We know something about that, how we were snatched up, chained, and shackled, and marched to slave fortresses on the west coast of Africa and in human conditions and put on those ships and brought over here. We know about how a lot of folks jumped overboard, how sometimes a mother would throw her child overboard to the sharks so that he would not have that slave experience. We know about the colonization and the rape of Africa. We know about black populations in places like Brazil, 
and the Caribbean, although we need to have a re-examination of those. There are certain other areas that deal with unfavorable white-black relationships in terms of groups or collectives that we have not effectively examined, and I'm going to look at three of those tonight. The way we're going to do this, in the course of about an hour and a half, maybe not even that long, is I'm going to go over this paper, I'm going to summarize it, and then we're going to take a brief break, it's just as brief as possible, five, ten minutes, and then we're going to set up a slide projector, and I'm going to illustrate the rest of this with a series of slides, and then we're going to have a summary. Is that okay? Very good. Are white people inherently evil? Are they, by their very nature, racist? No. At least I don't believe them to be. Now, I am not speaking for popularity, right? Because <laughs> a lot of people do believe that, and there may be something to it. But what I want to do is present some information, and you can draw your own conclusions. I'm looking at this from the perspective of a historian. That is my discipline. As a historian, however, it is exceptionally clear to me. <laughs> yeah, it may be, man. <laughs> and probably obvious to the entire world that white people generally possess an extremely brutal record vis-a-vis -vis black people. The European role in the transatlantic slave trade and the rape and subjugation of Africa are themselves clear damning and execrable demonstrations of white brutality and hostility towards blacks. Obviously, though, white-black relationships have not been confined to Africa and the Western Hemisphere. We supplement our knowledge here, therefore, in this brief survey of unfavorable white-black relationships by examining three very important geographic regions of the world that frequently escape the attention of African Americans or Africans living in America. That is India. Australia and Tasmania. We begin with India. Now we now know, based on recent scientific studies of DNA, that okay, y'all. Now this is, is is where he goes into specifically talking about um, what has happened in India, and specifically what has been going on for the last three thousand to three hundred uh, to three thousand five hundred years in India. So pay very close attention. That modern humanity originated in Africa that black people are the world's original people and that, and that all modern humans can ultimately trace their ancestral roots back to Africa. Everybody knows that, correct? There should be no doubt about those three things. Not only are black people the world's original people, however, black people created many of the world's earliest and most enduring civilizations. Such was the case in India. In ancient India, more than a thousand years before the foundation of Greece and Rome, proud and industrious black men and women known as Dravidians erected a classic high culture. Of the Dravidians, Marco Polo, the Venetian traveler who got around, observed that, and I want you to listen to what he had to say. He said, the darkest man is here, the most highly esteemed and considered better than the others who are not so dark. <laughs> Let me add that in very truth, these people portray and depict their gods and their idols black and their devils as white as snow. This is 800 years ago. For they, say that they like that, huh? For they say that God and all the saints are black, and the devils are all white. That is why they portray them as I have described. Now, about 3,500 years ago, classical civilization in India was disrupted by the incursion of violent, nomadic, patriarchal white tribes known as Aryans, A R. Y A N S. The Aryans were products of a place called the Eurasian Steppe. This was a region characterized by a feared hostility towards things foreign. Extreme individualism, characteristics some of us are picking up. Moral and material solitude, and what could only be called a pessimistic view of life itself. The ferocity of nature in the Eurasian Steppe created instincts essential for survival in such an environment. In this land, nature left no illusion of goodwill. It was merciless and allowed no negligence. And in the course of a long, painful, and bitter existence, Europeans could not afford the luxury of believing in a beneficent God that would shower down generous methods of gaining a livelihood. The harsh environment of Northern Europe in general and the Eurasian steppe in particular engendered in its people a harsh personality, a cold and cruel nature a violent, austere, and competitive culture and mentality. It was this type of culture, this type of mentality, the white people introduced into India. 
Now, the Aryans were not necessarily superior warriors and were not especially courageous on the battlefield, but they were aggressive, they developed sophisticated military technologies, and they glorified military virtues. After hundreds of years of conflict, the Aryans succeeded in subjugating most of northern India. And throughout the conquered territories, a rigid caste segmented, I'm going to talk about caste in some detail, a caste segmented social order was established with the masses of conquered black people who were called sudras, essentially reduced to slaves and imposed upon for service in any capacity required by their white conquerors. This vicious New World Order, which might be called a precursor to South African apartheid, was cold blood. I'm talking about 4,000 years ago now. For the slave trade, was cold bloodedly racist, with the whites on top, the so called mixed races in the middle, and the overwhelming majority of black people on the very bottom. In fact, the Aryan term, Varna, V A R N A, that is the classical division of Indian society which is used interchangeably with caste, literally means color or complexion. That's the social order of India. It means color or complexion. Truly, India is still a racist country. White supremacist David Duke claimed, and this is a direct quote, that his 1970s visit to India was a turning point in his views on the superiority of the white race. Not Mississippi, Georgia, or Alabama. India. Caste law in India, based originally on color and race, regulated all aspects of life, including marriage, diet, education, residence, and occupation. This is not to deny that there were certain elements within the black aristocracy that managed to gain prominence in the dominant white social structure. The mass of conquered blacks, however, were regarded by the whites as untruth itself. Now I want to stop right there. You heard what he just said, that yes, there were a, 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 a few black folks in the black people in the black uh, 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 aristocracy that were able to to to, to kind of maintain some level of position or whatever in this harsh white supremacy caste system but the but the overall masses of black people and, and that's the way it is with us here today that's the way it is in, on the continent of, of africa that's the way it is in every area globally where white supremacy has conquered uh, 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 the black nation, the black people. They allow one or two or a handful of black people to rise, to have, you know, pseudo positions of power or whatever. But it, it never it, it never gets around to everybody. White supremacy depends on that. That's necessary for the system to maintain itself is for at least a handful of black folks to be able for, for, uh, for the masses of black people to be able to look at a handful of black people and say, oh, well, they made it. Oh, well, they successful. Oh, well, look at them, you know, and then you wonder, OK, well, it, well, maybe I'm just not working hard enough or, or, or maybe, you know, I'm just not doing enough or, or, or maybe, you know, I just don't have the right connections or whatever. White supremacy depends on that in order for it to maintain its control over the masses. Let's keep going. The whites claim to have emerged from the mouth of God. The blacks were said to have emerged from the feet of God. It was written that a black who intentionally reviles whites by criminal abuse or criminally assaults them with blows shall be deprived of the limb with which he offends. If he has criminal intercourse with a white woman, his organs shall be cut off and all his property confiscated, brothers. If the woman had a protector, the sutra, the black person, shall be executed. If he listens intentionally to the recitation of a sacred text, his tongue shall be cut out. This is Hindu law. This is Indian law. This is white folks in India. If he commits them to memory, his body shall be cut in half. With the passage of time, this color-oriented, racially-based social order became the foundation of the religion which is practiced throughout all India. This is a religion known as Hinduism. Now, as savagely as the sutras of India, everybody still with me? As savagely as the sutras of India were dealt with, the greatest victims of white racism in India have been the untouchables. Indeed, probably the most substantial percentage of all the black people in Asia can be identified among India's 160 million untouchables. You've heard me talk about them before. 
you will hear me talk about them again because they are the largest population of black people outside of Africa and they are the most oppressed people in the world. No question about that. And that's a lot of people. The untouchables are the long suffering descendants of arrogant soldier unions and native black populations who retreated into the hinterlands of India in their efforts. Now I want y'all to hear that one more time. I want you to I want you to hear who the untouchables are. Hold on. Itself. The whites claim to have emerged from the mouth of God. The blacks were said to have emerged from the feet of God. It was written that a black who intentionally reviles whites by criminal abuse or criminally assaults them with blows shall be deprived of the limb with which he offends. If he has criminal intercourse with a white woman, his organs shall be cut off and all his property confiscated, brothers. If the woman had a protector, the sutra, the black person, shall be executed. If he listens intentionally to the recitation of a sacred text, his tongue shall be cut out. This is Hindu law. This is Indian law. This is white folks in India. If he commits them to memory, his body shall be cut in half. With the passage of time, this color-oriented, racially-based social order became the foundation of the religion which is practiced throughout all India. This is a religion known as Hinduism. Now, as savagely as the sutras of India, everybody still with me? As savagely as the sutras of India were dealt with, the greatest victims of white racism in India have been the untouchables. Indeed, probably the most substantial percentage of all the black people in Asia can be identified among India's 160 million untouchables. You've heard me talk about them before. You will hear me talk about them again because they are the largest. 160 million. That was the count at the time of this upload. 100 and well, at the time of this speech, 100, this lecture, 160 million untouchables, 160 million black folks that were considered to be untouchables. This population of black people outside of Africa, and they are the most oppressed people in the world. No question about that, and that's a lot of people. The untouchables are the long-suffering descendants of arrogant soldier unions and native black populations who were... So, the untouchables are actually the descendants of the unions between black folks and these Aryans that came in and conquered the land. These white Aryans that came in and conquered the land. Along with native groups of black people. So for all you folks out here practicing. All you black women out here practicing bed wenching. You know what I'm saying? And thinking that because you got a child by, 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 by somebody in the dominant society. Or because you laid up. And this goes for the, book, the, the bed bugs too. You laid up with somebody in the dominant society. You married somebody in the dominant society. You got kids with or by somebody in the dominant society. You say they don't look at you like they look at the rest of the niggas. Or whatever the case may be understand that these untouchables are descendants of those type of unions remember uh, uh, uh here in 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 antebellum slavery right here uh, in 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 north america uh slave owners could go and rape their black slaves and 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 and, and have babies by them and then turn around and sell those children so it, it so it's not uh understand that that sexual connotation never sways white supremacy. It never stops white supremacy. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't put a hold on white supremacy. So just understand. Just like it, it happened in slavery. Just like it happened in Africa. Just like it, it it happened all over the world. These white conquerors and these white invaders would go in and 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 have these unions, whether it be by rape by force or, or whether it be because uh, the women were willing participants and, and they would produce these children and these children weren't, treat, weren't treated any better than anybody else except for say maybe in some civilizations they wanted to use those mixed children as buffers and they set them up as buffer classes but they weren't treated a whole lot better so let's keep going treated into the hinterlands of India and the escape the advancing Aryan sphere of influence in which they ultimately succumb. India's untouchables number more than the, listen to this now, India's untouchables number more than the combined populations of England, France, 
Belgium and Spain put together. The existence of untouchability has been justified within the context of Hindu religious thought as the ultimate and logical extensions of karma and rebirth. Must have been something that you did in a previous lifetime. They say that's why you're born and untouchable. Hindus believe that persons are born untouchable because of the sins accumulated in previous lifetimes. Hindu texts describe these people as foul and loathsome, and any physical contact with them was considered polluting. Literally, any physical contact with them was considered an abomination to God. And there are three categories. Now, you, 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 you got to get this. You got to get that this is a part of the Hindu culture. This is a part of the Indian culture. This is a part of that caste system, that Varna caste system that was set up all these thousands of years ago by these white supremacist Aryans that came in. And, 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 and if you were black, uh, the, uh, the religion said that the reason why you were born and untouchable, the reason why you were born black and untouchable was because of some sins that you had committed in a previous lifetime. It was supposed to be karma that, that, that caused you to be born black and to be born untouchable. And these black folks were considered foul. That just to touch them, in some cases, just to look upon them was an abomination to God. Okay, this is how they justify treating these people like this and still treating them like this in Indian society today. Same way uh, 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 our slave masters over here in Annabellum slavery use the Bible to justify their treatment of black people. Their enslavement and treatment of black people. And, and could and could 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 string a, a black man up on Sunday after after leaving church could string a black man up you understand what I'm saying mutilate his body kill him maybe beat him to death or uh, 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 hang him lynch him shoot him castrate him and then burn him and and they call themselves good Christians. Of them. The first group are simply called the untouchables themselves. Their touch is considered polluting or contaminating. Secondly, you have a group called the unapproachables. Their shadow is considered polluting. Cold, ain't it? And it varies in, in different parts of India how close you can get to them. Some places it's 11 feet. Some places 75 feet. And then you have another group called the invisibles or unseeables. Their sight is considered polluting. And in large cities in India, until the 1920s, these people were not allowed to enter the cities within daylight hours because it was thought that shadows would cause pollution. These are black people. Untouchables were usually forced to live in pitiful little settlements on the outskirts of Hindu community. During certain periods in Indian history, untouchables were only allowed to enter the adjoining Hindu communities at night. Indeed, the untouchable shadows were considered polluting and they were required to beat drums and make loud noises to announce their approach. Untouchables had to attach brooms to their backs to erase any evidence of their presence. They had to attach a broom to their back so that when they walked down the street, I've seen it, so that when they walked down the street, these thorny branches would erase. Now you heard what the brother said. And this brother is doing this, this lecture in the 21st century. I'm thinking maybe the, 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 the late 1990s, early 2000s, he's doing this lecture. And he's saying that he has witnessed this with his own eyes in India, where these black people called untouchables have to strap uh, 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 brooms to their backs so that when they walk, the broom will erase any sign of their footsteps or any evidence that, that, uh, of their presence that they had ever even been there. any evidence that they have been there. Cups were tied around their necks to capture any spittle that might escape their lips and contaminate roads and streets. Their meals were taken or consumed from broken dishes. Their clothing was taken from corpses. They were forbidden to learn to read and write and were prohibited from listening to any of the traditional Hindu texts. So see, these people weren't even allowed to practice, openly practice Hindu. 
which is the, 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 the religious system in India. They weren't allowed to listen to any of the sacred texts. They're not allowed to enter the temples. You'll hear this in a few minutes. They weren't allowed to have any part of anything to do with um, higher uh, 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 Hindu society or Indian society. So they were truly outcasts. These folks didn't even where where, where they tried to with us and with and, and, and on the African continent where they tried to force us to become a part of their religion. You know, uh, 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 black folks had to become Christian and, and, and Africans had to become Christian. And over here, you, you know, they sold us their white Jesus and all of this. In India, they didn't even want them to be a part of their religious system. They were so they were so outcast and so forced out and so discriminated against and so hated that those white supremacists didn't even want them to be a part of their religious uh, uh, system, their their belief system. Those were denied regular access to public wells. They could not use ornaments and were not allowed to enter Hindu temples. The primary work of untouchables included scavenging and street sweeping, emptying toilets, the public execution of criminals, the disposal of dead animals and human corpses, and the cleanup of cremation ground. The daily life of the untouchable was filled with degradation, deprivation, and humiliation. Now, the basic status of India's untouchables has changed little since ancient times, and it has recently been pointed out, quote, that caste Hindus, listen to this now, this was written in 1992. Caste Hindus do not allow untouchables to wear shoes, ride bicycles, use umbrellas, or hold their heads up while walking in the street. Untouchables in urban India are crowded together in squalid slums, while in rural India, where the vast majority of untouchables live, they are exploited as landless agricultural laborers and ruled by terror and intimidation of this. Now, as evidence of this, let me cite several cases from different parts of India. For example, these cases were taken in 1991. Could have been taken last night, today, tomorrow. For example, on June 23, 1991, 14 untouchables were massacred in the eastern state of Bihar. That's the state where Buddha is supposed to receive enlightenment. On August 10, 1991, six untouchables were shot to death in the northern state of Uttar Pradesh. On August 16, 1991, that's my birthday, not 1991, August 16, an untouchable woman was stripped in public and savagely beaten in the southern state of Andhra Pradesh. I gave a lecture in Andhra Pradesh in 1987. On the 6th of September 1991, in the western state of Maharashtra, and I, listen to this now, an untouchable police officer was killed for entering a Hindu temple. It was raining, foreign cat, cats and dogs, as they say. Brother Sikh sought refuge in a temple. He was beaten to death for entering the temple. Official Indian figures on violent crimes by caste Hindus against untouchables have averaged more than 10,000 cases per year, with the figures continuing to rise. The Indian government listed 14,269 cases of atrocities by caste Hindus against untouchables in 1989 alone. 15,000 cases were documented in that one year. However, Indian human rights workers report that a large number of atrocities against untouchables, including beatings, gang rapes, Arson and murders are never recorded. Even when charges are formally filed, justice for, untou justice for untouchables is seldom dispensed. When I was in India, for example, there was a case where uh, a man was brought on charges of raping a woman, he admitted the crime. He was not, uh, just like um, this woman that uh, shot Latasha Harlan. She was uh, sent home. Same thing happened to this guy. His hand was slapped and he was told, don't do it anymore. Are white people inherently evil? Yeah. Are they born with an ingrained racist nature? Yeah. How about Australia? <laughs> Australia is officially... So this is where he ends. <coughs> <coughs> Hold on, y'all. This is where he ends the, that part of the discussion about India, and he moves on into talking about Australia. Now, like I said, this all all of this this information, these videos, these lectures will be linked in the description box, so you can go back and you can listen to them in in their entirety, and you can listen over again and over again and hear how these black people, these untouchables, are treated in India. And this is the culture. 
that Kamala Harris was raised in. This is the culture that she was raised with. These are the people, the people who subscribe to this, the people who believe in this. This is the belief system that Kamala Harris is coming from. This is the culture that she is coming from. She was raised by her mother. Because uh, 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 for those of you who listen to Jason Black, uh, TBA, remember TBA broke down uh, 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 the, 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 the whole thing with Kamala and her father, why she never talks to him, why, well, well, at least why she never talks about him, she never brings him up, she talks about her Hindu mother all the time, her Indian mother and her Indian family, but very, very seldom does she bring up her Jamaican father. And remember, there was this rift, there was this breakup, they were divorced, and Kamala's mother raised her and her sister. There was a time after they left the United States when they went back to India, and I think then from there they went to Canada or something like that. But these are the traditions that Kamala Harris was raised with. This is the culture that she was raised in. This is the belief system that she was raised in and raised around. She's upper caste because I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was her grandfather or her uncle on her mother's side or somebody that was actually a government official in India. So she's from that upper caste uh, in Indian society. And this is how these upper caste in Indian society, this is how they look at, this is how they feel about, this is the kind of hate and the kind of racism that they have towards black people. This is how black people are treated in India. They're, they're not even a part of the caste system. They're not even the lowest on the caste system. They are below the lowest of low. The untouchables. And this is what Kamala Harris, a woman who has come here and who now wants black people to vote for her, who now wants black people to put her in the second highest position in this United States of America. This is what Kamala Harris comes from. How dare you, Kamala Harris? How dare you? And it would be different if Kamala Harris or if Kamala Harris's Indian family had a track record. You understand what I'm saying? A, a, a visible track record of trying to help these untouchables in India. You understand what I'm saying? Trying to, 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 to uplift them and bring up their position in Indian society or, or even trying to get rid of that caste system altogether. But no, what does Kamala Harris do? Kamala Harris comes here and once she's placed in positions of power, County uh, uh, DA, uh, uh, state attorney general, once she's placed in positions of power, what does she do? She, 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 she exemplifies and, 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 and she does and, and shows exactly the culture that she was raised in. Towards black people here in America. Look at her record. As county, as county prosecutor and as a, 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 a state a, a, a attorney general. Look at her record towards black people. Keeping black folks in prison that are innocent. We got, we, we got that cage man, uh, uh, um, that's still on, uh, that's still serving life, even though all of this evidence came forward of, of, of prosecutorial misconduct in his case, how the prosecutor kept a uh, uh, certain information away from the defense that would have shown that this man was innocent and all of that. And Kamala Harris was determined to keep this man in prison. How she keeps black folks, black men and women in prison longer than their term past their prison sentence so that they can be there to work on these fire brigades to save these rich white folks homes. All those black mothers she locked up Talking about truancy policies. Matrice Richardson never did anything about that. Never did anything about that. So her record shows that all of that, that, that cultural beliefs that, that she got from India and how black people are looked upon in India 
She can't say she don't believe in it. She can't say that she don't practice it because once she was in placed in positions of power here in the United States, she showed that she believed in it. She showed that, that culturally she is one of those upper caste Hindus and she looks at black people here the same way they look at them over there. So she may not have been able to get away with some of the stuff that they can get away with over here. But what she could get away with over here, she did it under the under the eye, the guise of the law. So you got to understand where Kamala Harris is coming from. You got to understand culturally where she's coming from. You've got to understand the belief system that she's coming from. And this woman has the audacity to want black folks to vote for her and black women running around here talking about the first black woman this and Kamala Harris and all this sister girl stuff and y'all trying to have some kind of connection with Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris don't like you. She doesn't come from a culture where she's taught to like you. Where she's taught to look at you as equal to her. Where she's taught to look at you as good as her. She comes from a culture where she's taught and especially the darker you are, to look down on you, to hate you. If Kamala Harris is so about black people and Kamala Harris is so concerned with, with, with the black community and she's so concerned with our health and our welfare and our well-being and our economics and our education and all of that, then why was she never doing anything in her country to help those black people there. How dare she? How dare she expect us to support her? When that's the culture that she's coming from. And she has not shown us in any kind of way over here in the United States. How she feels any different from any of those other upper caste Hindus in India. As a matter of fact, what she has shown us is that's exactly how she feels. Just like them. She has proven that to us in her actions once she had any positions of power. So anybody who's stupid enough to believe the smooth, pretty words that might be coming out of her mouth now and looking over her history and looking over her record. Understand where this woman coming from, understand the culture that produced her. Now, let, 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 let's, 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 let's go a little bit deep and see if, 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 if Dr. Rashidi says anything else about it. Because this is another le lecture that he did. And this one is was uploaded August the 26, 2017. And these are on YouTube. And like I said, I'll have the links in the description box. Um, and this is what he did. The, the, the Dalits. That's what uh, of India part one. And that's what they call the untouchables. The Dalits. I've been preparing for for about 10 years to do this kind of talk. Uh, I'm going to introduce the first part of the program. But tonight's presentation will focus on the African presence in India, but specifically it will focus on what are called the black untouchables of India. Now, I was talking to somebody last night. I'm grateful to have had a chance with Brother Velu uh, to be on Intervisions a couple of nights ago and front page uh, yesterday. And I was talking to somebody about the untouchables, and they told me that they had in turn discussed it with somebody else. And they said that they thought they were talking about Al Capone and Elliot Ness, you know, when it comes to the untouchables, right? But tonight we're talking about the black untouchables. And that means, as I understand it, that the very touch, in some cases, the voice or even the shadow of these black people in India is supposed to cause pollution or contamination. And the black folks that we're talking about tonight are uh, without question to me the most oppressed people in the world. Not the most oppressed black people in the world, which says a lot right there, but the most oppressed people on the planet. Now you've heard all kinds of horror stories in The Good Life. Um, I was fortunate a few months ago to, I was fortunate a few months ago to 
have the opportunity to introduce a black woman from Australia, a sister named Grace Smallwood. And she talked about her own personal experiences and what it meant to be a, a so-called Australian Aborigine. The fact that when the British came in the late 1700s, black people in Australia began to be used as target practice, or they were murdered to be used as dog food. And in some parts of Australia, even until the 1960s, like in Queensland, Australia, black people, it is said, were not allowed to wear shoes. That European convicts, because those were the white folks who settled Australia, would oftentimes play... Uh, a, a little bit of, of, of history from us. Um, he said that uh, uh, these convicts from Europe were the ones that settled Australia. Okay, well, uh, for our history over here in the in 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 the Americas, uh, after the 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 colon the colonies at Jamestown and some of the others failed because they failed because those folks came over here they didn't have the right relationship with the natives that were already here. Uh, they didn't know how to uh, work the land. They didn't know how to feed themselves. They didn't know how to do anything. Uh, and, and at first, you know, they they, they ate themselves and, and, and that, you know, they, they, they committed all kinds of cannibalism and all of this kind of stuff. Well, when it, when they sent word back to Britain that these colonies needed to be refurbished or, or, or they needed more people over here for these colonies, what Europe, what, what Britain did was it emptied out its, its so-called insane asylums and it emptied out its prisons and it sent those folks over here. And those folks became the new colonists. And it was because of uh, uh, their lack of being able to do anything for themselves, their lack of knowing how to work the land, uh, their lack of knowing how to grow food and all of this kind of stuff, that they started enslaving uh, Africans and bringing them here. So this practice of using convicts and, and, and folks from the insane asylums and all of that to, to settle these places and to be these colonists, see, that, that's, that was a, that was a well-known, well-used practice. And as you just heard, that's exactly what they did in Australia. Okay? Play a game with black infants and they would take the mother and they would take a black family. And it's nice to see we have some families here tonight. I'm a family man myself now, I'm happy to say. Uh, they would take a, a family of black people and they would murder the father or the husband. But before that, they would rape, you know, his wife in front of him. And then they would take the man's head, the black man's head, they would decapitate it. And then somehow or another, fix a rope and tie the head around the widow's neck as they repeatedly sexually assaulted her. And then while the mother was still alive, I want you to hear what I'm saying, they would take infants and bury them up to their neck in the sand. And then stand back and let the football take turns to see who can kick the heads off of black babies the farthest. This is a game. They used nuclear testing against black people in Australia. Until 1967, black people in Australia were counted as part of the flora and fauna. Did you hear me? Until 1967... Black people in Australia were not counted as humans. They were counted as part of the flora and fauna. So, you know, we've suffered. We've suffered over here. We've suffered all over Africa. But in India, the suffering has been that intense, that extreme, or more. But what makes it different is that it has been going on for something like 3,000 years. So that the indoctrination of inferiority as applied to black people in general and black untouchables in particular are unprecedented. Let me read you a bit, and I'm going to deal with the history. But let me just read a little bit about what the life of the Black Untouchable was like. I'm reading from this work here that I edited, uh, The African Presence in Asia, which has contributions by a black man named B.T. Rashekar, the first person that, the person that wrote this book. I did not write this book. I wrote the afterword to it. And Velu supplied the photographs. And by the way, this on the cover of the book is a black woman from South Central Australia. I'm sorry, South Central India. And she's in tears, as you can see. And it says on the cover, the outside world hardly knows in India there's a 3,000-year-old 3, problem called untouchability. And when you come to know the real facts, you will be in tears. So if we had a little laughter earlier, 
it may be good to kind of lighten the mood because it's a very brutal story and it's not for the faint-hearted. I went to India on a historic trip in 1987 in October, and I tell you, for six months I was just terribly depressed, moping around, just seeing the reality of our people there. Let me read a bit about what the life was like for the untouchables. The existence, the existence of untouchability has been justified within the context of Hindu religious thought as the ultimate and logical extensions of karma and rebirth. Karma and rebirth. Hindus believe that persons are born untouchable because of the accumulation of sins in previous lives. For caste Hindus, any physical contact with an untouchable was regarded as polluting. During certain periods in Indian history, untouchables were only allowed to enter the adjoining Hindu communities at night. And indeed, the untouchables, very shadows, were considered polluting. And they were required to beat drums, and I hope you're listening to this now, and make loud noises to announce their approach so other people could scurry out of the way. Until the 1920s, in some parts of India, for example, the large West Indian city of Pune, untouchables were not allowed to enter the city limits within the hours of 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. because it was thought their shadows would be too long because of the position of the sun. Untouchables had to attach brooms to their backs to erase any evidence of their presence. And cups were tied around their neck to capture any spittle that might escape their lips and contaminate the roads and the streets. So spit came from their lips, the streets would be contaminated. Their meals were consumed from broken dishes. So basically what, what, what they were saying is, basically what the Hindu believe is that the streets, the very streets, the very ground was better than these black people. And that if their spittle hit the ground or hit the streets, the street would become contaminated. Because the ground, the street was better than this black person. Then this black person spit. Okay? Dishes. And their clothing was taken from corpses. They were forbidden to learn to read and write and were prohibited from listening to any of the sacred Hindu texts. The Rig Veda, the Mahabharata, the Bhagavad Gita, the Upanishads, the Brahmanas. Regular access to public wells was denied them. They could not use ornaments. And they were not allowed to enter Hindu temples. You could be killed. Untouchables have been killed within the last few years for merely entering a temple. In some parts of India, as I understand it, there are temples and there's a ring of stones around the temples, approximately 30 feet or 50 feet from outside the temple walls. And the untouchables are not only not allowed to go inside the temple, they can't go within the ring because it is thought their shadows will cause the gods in the temples to be polluted. That's the nature of Hinduism. The primary work of untouchables included scavenging and street sweeping, emptying toilets, the public execution of criminals, the disposal of dead animals and human corpses, and a cleanup of cremation grounds, all of which were regarded as impure activities by caste Hindus. The daily life of the untouchables was one, as you can see, of degradation, deprivation, and humiliation. Now, unfortunately, that has not changed very much. Uh, today, for example, the literacy rate among untouchables, untouchable women is about 7%. So they kept very uneducated, formally, and, and no, I won't say uneducated, they kept illiterate. Uh, untouchables in urban India, in places like Bombay and Calcutta and Madras and Bangalore, are crowded together in squalid slums. While in rural India, where the vast majority of untouchables live, they are exploited as landless agricultural laborers and ruled by terror and intimidation. Uh, every year, within the last 10 years, the amount of atrocities committed by untouchables by the other castes have averaged 10 to 15,000 cases per year. They include gang rape, they include arson, they include murders. It's not unusual to hear about untouchables in India being burned alive reminds you very much of what was happening to black people over here in certain periods. 
I have photographs that were being given to me by members of the government in India where a black boy was burned to death, and I have photographs of his ashes and what have you. You have stories about untouchable children who were forced to eat human excrement as a form of punishment. Velu has an article that he just brought me, and this is not stuff we're making up. That was... So that was part one. And um, like I said, I'll have uh, all of this stuff linked in the description box so that you can hear all of this stuff yourself about how these uh, untouchables, these black untouchables are treated in India. And this has been ongoing for 3,000 years. And you have to understand that these people have been indoctrinated to believe that the reason why they were born, quote unquote, black untouchable is because of past sins, the sins that they committed in a past life or whatever. And they have been so indoctrinated until they don't feel like they wor they're worth anything. They don't feel like they deserve to be treated any better. Same way uh, 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 the dominant society and white supremacy use religion against us here in, in, in North America and made us believe that uh, uh, because we were black and, 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 and Jesus was white and God was white and, and the white folks were closer to God that, you know, uh, in, in many cases, they use religion to subjugate us, to keep us subjugated, to keep us believing that we were in our proper place while the dominant society was in their proper, proper place above us. And they actually used black preachers to go around that. They, uh, uh, they say that Nat Turner was one, that they actually used black preachers to go around and preach to other slaves. To keep them subjugated, to keep them in line, to keep them from revolting and all of that. So religion has been used in so many ways against us. But this is what, this is the culture that you people, you have to understand. This is the culture that Kamala Harris comes from. This is the belief system that she comes from. How dare she act like there's something different going on? How dare she act like she's a black woman? How dare she act like she identifies with or connects in any kind of way to the black experience? When this is how black people are treated in her country. When this is, the, this is culturally how she was taught that black folks are supposed to be treated. And again, it would be a totally different conversation if she had come here or let, let, let me say it again. If, if we had seen any kind of track record of where her family in India did something different. Where they tried to fight for these black untouchables, where they tried to change the system or, 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 or they tried to bring about some kind of disbanding of, of, of that whole caste system in India. Or if Kamala had come here and, and, and once given the opportunity, once put in some position of power where she could actually help black people and actually uplift black people and actually uplift the black community where she had done that. But once she got here and again was, was given any kind of power, what did she do? She continued what she knows. She continued that culture. She continued it here. And pushed it as far as she could here. And she, used, and she used the law to do it. So again, my question is, how dare you? How dare you now expect us to support you? When that's the culture you come from and you have exhibited that belief, that belief system here in the United States against black people. You have a record of it. So that, that this is history lesson part one. And I, and I just, you know, it, 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 it was amazing when I got this information and the more I listened, I was like, hold on. I, I just can't, I can't keep this to myself. I can't 
or, or, or sit back and hope that somebody else will bring this information out, that somebody else will point this out, that somebody else will make that connection between uh, 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 this Hindu caste system and this Hindu culture and this and this Hindu belief system and what these black untouchables are going through over there and make that connection with Kamala Harris. I couldn't wait for somebody else to do it. I had to put it together and I had to bring it to you. So that you could do a little bit of research on it and you could share it with other people so that you could listen to these lectures and listen to what Dr. Rashidi has to say about how Africans and how black people are now are, 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 have always, at, at least for the last 3000 or more years, been treated in India. And that's the reason why Kamala Harris tries to kind of separate herself from the Indian culture when she wants to, when she wants to pander to black folks, when she wants to pander, especially to black women. But you got to understand, she was not raised to look at you the same way she sees herself. She was not raised to believe that you can rate, that you can be lifted up to her level as a black person, whether you be a black man or a black woman. And the black women over there are treated so bad. You will hear when you get into these different lectures, you will hear how the black women are, are, are these black untouchable women are, 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 are used as sex slaves, how they are sexually exploited, how, how they, how, how uh, these upper caste men can just, can just take them up and rape them and gang rape them in the middle of the streets. Uh, uh, there was one case that he talks about where this woman's uh, two sons, uh, were caught stealing because they were hungry. So they were caught stealing food, right? Okay. They were beaten. The, the mother was, uh, was, was beaten, dragged in the street, uh, stripped naked in the street, beaten in public and was publicly forced to have sex with both of her sons. And this is what Kamala Harris is coming from. This is the culture that she's coming from. This is the belief system that she's coming from. How dare you think that we're stupid enough to believe that you're going to come here and try to do something for us black folks when you ain't never tried to do nothing for the black folks over there where you come from. When you already have a track record over here of doing what you can to harm us. So for anybody that's thinking about voting for uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, not only are you getting Joe Biden's form of racism, you're getting this deep seated form of racism that Kamala Harris has grown up in. That, that Kamala Harris was the culture that she was a part of and that she was raised in. I would dare say that, it, that, that it, if it's at all possible, she's probably more racist than him. If that's possible. But this is the kind of deep seated hatred towards black people that this woman's culture produces. So please, all I ask is that you get down in that description box, you listen to, 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 to these different uh, uh, lectures by Dr. Rashidi, and, and, and then once you get this information, you share this information, you have these conversations uh, uh, on social media and off of social media, talk about this, talk, you know, talk to your family members about them, let them listen to some of these lectures, because like I said, the links to these lectures will be in the description box, let them listen to this, uh, uh, you do your own research, type it because there are books that have been written about the untouchables in India. Uh, uh, there's information uh, online that, you know, that you can look at and that you can read about the untouchables in India, because this is not something that we here in America, that FBA in America, this is not something that we do a whole lot of talking about, that we hear a whole lot about. But this is how our black people are being treated in India. And this woman has the audacity to come here with that belief system and being a part of that culture and after showing us since she's been here having a track record of how she targets and harms black people using the law this woman has the audacity to now ask us to put her in the second highest position of authority in the united states
And she wants black folks to do it. So y'all, please, 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 please like this video. Please share this video. Please have these conversations. Share the links to his lectures uh, uh, about how black untouchables in India are treated. Have these conversations. And for any black foundational black American, any black American period that's thinking about voting for Kamala Harris, take all of this into consideration and understand that this is what you're getting. And at the end of the day, if you vote for this and you put this in this highest seat of power and, and, and she shows you more of what she's already shown, you won't have anybody to fault but yourself. If you're not subscribed to the channel, please subscribe to the channel. Please hit that bell notification so you can be notified when we upload more videos. History lesson part two is coming. But this was just, this was something that I just thought was urgent. It was something that I felt like needed to be put out there. And like I said, I couldn't leave it to chance that somebody else would put this information out and connect this dot and bring this together and show you a, 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 a picture of the culture that come a, a, a really, really, um, specific picture of the culture that Kamala Harris comes from. And in these lectures, Dr. Rashidi, after he talks, he does do this slideshow where he shows you different slides and, and, and shows you these different uh, 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 untouchables and the areas that they come from. He talks about his experiences of going to these areas and talking to these folks and, and, and how some of them were so afraid that they, that they would, when he tried to take out the, the camera to take pictures of them, they ran because they thought it was a gun, that he was there to kill them. I mean, these people have been terrorized. It's, it's, it's brutal. It is brutal. And this is what this woman is coming from. And just because she used her immigrant status and all of this kind of stuff to go to an HBCU and all of this. And just because, you know, she was a part of a sorority and all of that. Now we're just supposed to fall at her feet. No, that's what she's expects. That's, that's what she expects because of the culture that she came from. She expects black folks to just fall at her feet. Because she's an upper caste Hindu. She expects us. To still fall at her feet, even though she has shown that she doesn't care. Even though she has shown how she will harm black people if given the chance. Even though she has point blank out of her own mouth told us that no, she would not specifically do anything just for black people. But because of the belief system, because of the culture that she comes from. She believes that no matter what she does, black folks are just supposed to fall at her feet. And that's exactly what she's expecting you to do. And if you vote for her, that's exactly what you'll be doing. You will become a part of, kind of in, in, inadvertently become a part of that whole caste system over there. And this belief that she has that because she is who she is, that no matter how she treats black folks, they just supposed to fall at her feet. So y'all need to get busy sharing this stuff. Y'all need to get busy having these conversations. Y'all need to get busy not just sharing my videos where I talk about it, but actually sharing the, the links that I put in these videos of these individual uh, uh, historians and experts. Talking about this stuff and lecturing on this stuff. So that people can understand what we're really getting. And we can understand who we're deal really dealing with. We already know about Joe Biden. We already know about his racist past. But, but let's look a little bit deeper into Kamala and the culture that she's coming from. And how she has exhibited her belief, her, her belief in that system, in that belief system, in that culture since she's been here in the United States. Once she was given a little bit of power, once she was given the ability to actually do black folks some harm, she did it. She certainly didn't do anything to help us. <coughs> 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 so.
So y'all get busy with this. Y'all get busy having these conversations. Y'all get busy putting this information out there. And I'll be with you shortly with history lesson number two. Y'all have a good afternoon. Okay, fam, I just wanted to bring y'all this little addition to the video and let you know that included in the links in the description box will also be uh, some links from some lectures by a Dr. V. Anomaly. An anom an an anomaly. I, I don't know how to, I, I'm, I'm not exactly sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but he's actually from India and um, he gives some lectures uh, where he also talks about the, the caste system in India. He also talks about the the uh, the uh, Dalit, the Dalits, which uh, that's the that's the formal name for the black untouchables in India. And it's very interesting to hear it say it and, and to hear it presented by um, an Indian, by somebody from India. So um, in the description box, I will also have his uh, lectures linked as well so that you can hear from him and you can get it from an actual Indian's perspective and get the history from him as well because him and Dr. Rashidi kind of work hand in hand. So I just wanted to let y'all know and um, I will separate the, the videos and I will have uh, Dr. Rashidi's videos and uh, and then I'll have um, Dr. Amali's videos. So they'll, the videos will be separated so that you'll know exactly who you're listening to. So I just wanted to bring y'all guys that little added information and let you know what's going on down there in the description box. All right. I'll talk to you later.